Lord Jesus, we thank you um, for this opportunity again to to uh, to open your word and to to hear you speak to us. We're looking forward to what you want to say um, because we believe that you you have something to say to your church. And um, so, Lord, give us open ears, open minds, open hearts. And uh, and then as we leave this place, Lord, help us not to just kind of believe what we heard here, but to take it with us, to make it a part of our lives, and to live in obedience to what you teach us. And so, Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and to be our teacher and to to minister to each heart as as we have need. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can turn again in your Bibles this morning to uh, Paul's letter to the Philippians. Uh, we're going to be continuing our study there. You know, as I was thinking about this upcoming um, sabbatical, one of the things that I, that I hope will happen is that I'll have some time to really kind of think and pray and evaluate my, my own priorities, what it is that I give time to, and um, and uh, what are what are the things that should be really be driving my my life and, and, and my ministry? I, I find that most times life is just going too fast for most of us to find sufficient time to really, uh, in prayer and reflection, uh, think about the issues of life and mission. So, part of my hope is that the sabbatical will um, will provide that opportunity. As I was thinking about, I, I was thinking about that as you know, as I was reading. Again, in Philippians uh, this week, um, I was thinking that I, I suspect that the that the Apostle Paul suddenly found that he now had um, more uh, time than usual to give to thought and and um, and prayer um, to his life goals and the passions that were the driving force in his life and, and ministry. But um, it's not because he took a sabbatical; it's because um, actually the reason for that he had, in his case, that he had more time was that he landed in prison. For his faith, um, let me say that I prefer the sabbatical. So, uh, <laughs> thank you again for making that possible. Um, anyway, today before we celebrate communion uh, together, uh, I want us to take a few moments to go back again to Paul's letter because we discover throughout his letter really uh, what it is that that drives Paul, what his ambition is, what uh, life is all about from Paul's perspective. And so I want to go back this morning again to Philippians chapter 1, and we're going to read here verses 12 to 26. Remember, Paul here is filling in, um, filling the Philippians in on kind of the latest news from his end, right? As we often do in letters, right? And uh, he's telling them about how things are going with him because they had heard that he was in prison for his faith, and so they were very concerned um, concerned to the point that they actually sent somebody from their church, a, a fellow named Epaphroditus, to visit Paul and to to take him a, a care package, if you will, right? And um, so, so Paul, in response to that visit and in response to their to their concern for him, writes this letter uh, that we call Philippians here, and uh, he sends it back to them with Epaphroditus. And as we've noted, Paul's report to them in this letter is really pretty upbeat. Um, it's not perhaps what we might have expected from someone who found himself in chains in prison. And, and we've, we've looked over the, the past few weeks here uh, at some of what Paul tells them about his perspective of, you know, how things are, how things are going for him and, and, uh, and, and how he sees it potentially panning out in, in the end. But today I want to kind of wrap up our study of this particular section of, of Paul's letter by kind of summarizing for us from the here, what we might call Paul's uh, mission statement. Now, I don't think people really talked about mission statements back uh, back in those days, but you know, today they're all the rage, aren't they? Every business, every organization, every church is, you know, you got to have your mission statement, you know. So what's a mission statement? Well, really, it's just, it's an attempt to express in just a few words what what the purpose, the, the aim, the, or the mission of the organization is all about. Why do we exist, right? What is, our, what is our purpose? What is our aim? What is our mission? Well, as I said, I'm pretty sure that Paul and his missionary team didn't have, you know, a mission statement 
uh, on a plaque on the wall in their office or, you know, posted on their website or, or you know, on, on their uh, letterhead or whatever. But the truth is that as you read Paul's letter, it's not hard to figure out what's important to him, is it? It's not hard to figure out what really lights his fire. It kind of shows up all, through, all throughout this letter. And today we're going to see it specifically in this passage. But don't be surprised when it keeps popping up again and again as we, as we move through this letter over the coming weeks. So let's read this passage again, and then let's see if we can kind of distill into just a few words what life and ministry is all about from Paul's perspective. And, and, and listen, I, I, I want us to look at this today, not just out of curiosity, you know, so that we can kind of learn more, or understand Paul better or understand this letter better. But because I'm convinced that these same things that we're going to see that are important to Paul really should be important to us, too, as individuals and, and as a church. In other words, I'm suggesting that maybe we, we should, in essence, adopt Paul's mission statement, his ambition, his focus and priorities as, as our own. So if you have your Bible open there to Philippians chapter 1, and I hope you do, we're going to start this morning at verse 12, and we're going to read down through verse 26. By the way, this should sound familiar to you, right? Um, because we've been already been looking at these verses over the last few weeks. But today we're going to try and kind of wrap it up with some final thoughts from this passage. So Philippians 1, starting with verse 12, and here's what Paul says. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It's true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you uh, for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. So there are three things here this morning that, uh, that we, we find in this passage that I think, I, I think will probably be included in Paul's mission statement, if, if he had one. <laughs> and the truth is, really, that each one of these um, really deserves a whole sermon of its own, or even a whole series of, of sermons. But today we're going to just kind of touch on them briefly, because as I said, they're actually going to be coming up again as we, as we move through this letter. So we will have opportunity to delve in them, into them uh, further as we go along. So here's the first thing I want to point out that, that uh, Paul felt passionately about. And that is the advance of the gospel. The advance of the gospel. His, his, was a, his ambition was a, a gospel advancing ambition. And that's, that's fairly obvious here and in many other places throughout Paul's letter. He was all about getting the gospel to, to people and to places where it had never reached before. And, and that hasn't changed just because he happens to be in prison here. And that's still the driving ambition of his life, uh, to see the gospel advance. And, and that's why he's excited, actually, because in spite of, and perhaps even because of his imprisonment, the gospel is being preached and people are responding. And so he says to his friends in Philippi, who are probably thinking that, you know, with, with the great apostle Paul in jail, now everything's come to a standstill. He says, no, listen, um, 
I, I want you to know that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. And, and that's why Paul is, is really not too hung up about his, his situation. I, I mean, I'm sure he'd prefer not to be in prison, but he's all about seeing the gospel advance. And so he says, hey, if this is what it takes for the gospel to, to reach some of these people, then so be it. So Paul's excited because although he's in prison and he doesn't have the freedom to do some of the things that he usually does, he still has opportunities to share the gospel. And as a result, um, the gospel is penetrating into areas that, that perhaps would not have been reached in any other way. And so he's excited about the opportunities that he's had to share the gospel. But he's also excited, he says, because his imprisonment has encouraged other believers to, to step forward and to to speak boldly for Christ. So this is a good thing. Even, he says, even when the motives of some are not what he would have wished, the point is that whether from false motives or true, he says, Christ is being preached. In other words, Paul says, the important thing is the advance of the gospel. So in summary, while things may not seem to be turning out super well for him, they are turning out well for the gospel. And in that he rejoices. Let me ask you, how passionate are you about seeing the gospel advance? And, and, and what price would you be willing to pay in order that others may hear about Christ? You see, it's easy for us to say, oh yeah, I want to see the, I want to see the gospel advance. That, that's good. But is it really a defining priority in our life as it was for Paul. You see, the, the truth is that even as a church, we can so easily get caught up in just, just keeping things running, you know? I mean, just doing our programs and showing up at the right time and doing our churchy things, you know? And uh, But the advance of the gospel is not really the motivating a factor at the center of it all. We can get comfortable and we can forget that all around us are people who need Jesus. That needs to be always at the center of our thoughts, of our, of our planning, uh, of our mission and of our purpose as a church because God cares deeply about this. And so should we. Now the next thing I want you to see here that is a driving force in Paul's life is a Christ-magnifying ambition. His ambition is not only a gospel-advancing ambition, it is also a Christ-magnifying ambition. We saw last week how, how Paul really defines his life around Christ. To me, to live, he says, is Christ. And as we said last week, we could spend a lot of time going deep into that about, you know, discussing together what that really means and its implication for our lives, you know, to, to really, what it means to really put Christ at the center. Paul says here in verse 20 that his aim is that no matter what happens by life or by death, that Christ would be exalted in his life and in his body. Some of the other translations say that Christ would be magnified, which is another good way of expressing what Paul's saying here. What do we do when we magnify something? Hmm? Well, we, we, we make it appear larger, right? So how do we magnify Christ? How do we make him appear larger? Well, of course, we're never going to actually make him really larger or greater than he really is. But it's, it's kind of like what happens, for example, when, when you look at Jupiter through a telescope, right? There, there are times of the year when, if you know where to look, um, you can see Jupiter in the night sky. Don't, don't ask me where, I really have no idea, but it's out there somewhere and, and it can be seen, right? Um, uh, of course, it's only, it's only a tiny little speck there. And so it's, it can be hard to find. But, you know, it's so small that it's easy, isn't it, to forget that it's actually the largest planet in the whole solar system. Did you know that you can actually, f you could fit 1,300 Earths into Jupiter. Wow. And, and the Jupiter is actually two and a half times heavier than 
all of the other planets, including Earth, all of the other ones combined. It's huge. It's huge. But from our perspective here on Earth, it's just a little dot in the sky, right? So we get a telescope, right? And even with a telescope, we can't really fully grasp the size of, of Jupiter, but it, it helps, doesn't it? And Because a, a, a telescope magnifies. It takes something that seems small, and it makes it appear larger. Not larger than it really is, but larger than what we would see on our own. Listen, you, you know this as well as I do, but to most of the world, Christ is of little importance. They don't see him as anything that has any significance uh, for their lives. They have no idea of his greatness, of his power, of his, of his majesty. To them, he is small and insignificant and distant, just like Jupiter appears to us. And our job as believers in Christ is to magnify him. To, by, by, by the way that we live, by the way that we worship, by the, by the way in which uh, we obey him, so that, so that we may take Christ, who appears small, insignificant, and, and distant, and reveal him as great and glorious and near. That's what Paul wants his life to be about. I want to magnify Christ. He says, I want everybody to know about him. I want people to see him as he really is. Not small, insignificant, and distant but great and glorious and near. <laughs> that's, why, that's, why, that's why nobody seems to be able to get Paul to shut up and quit talking about Christ, right? I mean, he's to, uh, his great goal in life is that everyone would know about Christ, that he would be exalted and lifted up and magnified. And we should do the same. Our lives should magnify Christ. Do they? Do they? When people observe our lives, what do they see of Christ? What, what do they learn of Christ? Do they only see a Christ who is small and insignificant and distant? Or do our lives reveal Christ as being great and glorious and near? When people visit our church, is Christ magnified in our worship? Is he magnified in our fellowship together? Is he magnified in how we respond to the word? Do, do people leave here thinking, Man, those people seem to be really seem to be hung up on Christ. I mean, I didn't know before that he was like that, the way that they talk about him and the way that they 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 worship him. You know, I thought of him as small and insignificant and distant, but when I went to that church for the first time, I saw him as great and glorious and 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 near. Don't you want that to be people's experience of church? Don't don't you want that to be your own experience of church? Paul says, my life and my ministry are all about magnifying Christ. He's, he's front and center. It's, it's, it's all about him. As I said, we could spend a whole lot of time on that point too. But let me point out one other aspect here of Paul's mission statement, if you will. It's evident as we read this passage and as we read through the letter as a whole that Paul had a people-focused ambition. His ambition was not just a gospel advancing ambition, not just a Christ magnifying ambition, but it was also a people focused ambition. In other words, he cared about people. You see, that that's sometimes the danger of a mission statement, isn't it? Um, we can easily become very uh, task oriented and, and program focused and obsessed with numbers and outcomes and all that kind of thing. And people and relationships can easily just kind of get set aside or left in the dust. Not so with Paul. You see, here's the thing. When Christ is the center of your life, people become the focus of your life. In other words, the more you fall in love with God, the more you fall in love with the things that God loves. And what does God love? People. People. That's why we find his law summarized in those two inseparable commands, right? To love God and, and, and to, to love people, right? Jesus, you remember, was asked, which is the most important commandment? And he responded with two. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And what? Love your neighbor 
as yourself. You see, sometimes I think our secret hope is that if we can do the first one well, that we'll kind of get a pass on the second one. <laughs> you know, but, but it doesn't work that way. As believers and as a church, we are, or we should be, all about people because we're all about Christ. This is the heart of Christ. It's a heart for people. God cares about people. Listen, if you had any doubt about that, the story of the gospel should convince us, right? What does John 3.16 say? For God loved, so loved the world, people, that he gave his only son. God was willing to sacrifice his own son to a cruel death on a cross in order that people, you and I, might have a relationship with him. God loves people. Do you? Sometimes it's hard to love people, isn't it? I don't know if you know this or not, but there's a little saying that circulates among pastors, and I, I confess uh, that I've said it on occasion myself, and it goes like this. Ministry would be great if it weren't for people. <laughs> right? Did you ever hear that? <laughs> Ministry would be great if it weren't for people. Now, that's said in jest, of course, although... I think for most pastors, there are probably some days when it's a pretty accurate description of how they, of how they actually feel. And it's, you may feel the same way sometimes. Ministry would be great. Life would be great if it weren't for people. But listen, ministry is people. Right? I can't forget that. You, you can't forget that. As a church, we dare not forget that. It's about people. And yeah, that makes it messy sometimes <laughs> and frustrating sometimes. But it also makes it incredibly rewarding. And what's even more important, it gives it eternal worth because programs and buildings and budgets don't last. But investing in people is an investment for all of eternity. And, and, and let me say that there's not really a conflict between loving God and loving people. Because the truth is that the more your heart is centered on Christ, the more your eyes will see people. Because that's what he sees. In fact, I think one of the greatest tests of whether you're really centered on Christ or not is the degree uh, to which you care about people. Because this is the heart of Christ. People. So Paul says, as, as we saw last week, that although he's certainly looking forward to going to heaven and, and to being with Christ, that he's also convinced that to remain in the body is, is to be preferred at this point because it will mean fruitful labor, he says. What labor is he talking about? Making tents? Remember, Paul Paul was in the business of making tents. That's what he did for a living. He was a tent maker. So was he saying, you know, I'd like to stay around longer so I can make more tents? <laughs> is that what he was saying? No, obviously not. For him, fruitful labor meant investing in people, investing in the growth and progress in the gospel of his friends and, and fellow believers, the Philippians, and investing in people who had not yet come to faith in Christ. So Paul is essentially saying, I'm going to delay what is best for me, heaven, in order to do what's best for you. That's the heart, really, of what it means to be people-focused. And interestingly, you know, in the very next chapter, in chapter 2, we're, we're going to see where Paul got that idea from, right? Because... Um, uh, we're going to see that that's exactly what Christ did for us. He set aside what was best for him, didn't he, in order to do what was best for us. He did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, chapter 2, verse 6 there. right? But he made himself nothing, taking on the, the very nature of a servant and becoming obedient to death, death on the cross. Aren't you glad he did? He cared about people. You know, I'd like to have met Paul, wouldn't you? He, he seemed like a quite a guy, high energy, you know, super focused. Um, but I, I may not have ever had the opportunity to have met him, but I have read his letters. And, and you don't have to read very far before you get a pretty clear idea about what he was about, what his priorities uh, were. It, it, it comes out in, uh, in, uh, on the page in many places, doesn't it? And, but I don't know about you, but I'm challenged by them. I'm challenged because it seems pretty evident on the basis of Scripture that um, 
that we're all called to, to have those same priorities, um, to, to buy into Paul's mission statement, if you will. What we see here really is what we are all to be about as individuals and as a church. We're to be all about advancing the gospel and magnifying Christ in people-focused ministry. Doesn't that sound like the kind of church that you would want to be a part of? Well, well, then let's ask God to make us into that kind of a church by his grace. You know, some time ago I was at, I was at an event um, where John Stumbo was preaching or speaking. Uh, John is uh, the president of the Christian and Missionary Alliance, which is the fellowship of churches of which we are a part. And uh, I remember that part of what he was talking about on that particular occasion was exactly this. That's this nature, question of the nature of the church, what, uh, what our priorities are to be, um, what we're to be about, our mission statement, if you want to call it that. Uh, in other words, what would, what would describe us and what are those non-negotiables, biblically speaking, that define who we are and what we're to be about? And he shared then about how he had been in a meeting once with some other uh, church leaders. And, and uh, when, when this one fellow had said that from his perspective, um, that a church, whether it's a local body or some larger expression of, of the church, is, is really made up of and defined by three things. Beliefs, mission, and relationships. That is, there are beliefs that we hold. There's a mission that we share. And there are relationships that we value. That kind of is what defines us, uh, if you will. And Dr. Stumble said that that really stuck with him. And, and um, over the coming days and months, he kept thinking about that and, and talking with others a lot about what would be the unique uh, alliance expression of that uh, outline of beliefs, mission, and, and relationships. Um, uh, um, if, if you were to put together a description of of our church or of any church, uh, based on those categories, what would it look like? You know, what would that description be? So after a lot of thought and prayer and conversation uh, with others, um, uh, he here's what Dr. Stumbo and others of our alliance leaders came up with, and have been using as kind of a tagline um, to, to to answer the question of who we are and and. Uh, what, what, what we are to be in just a few brief words. We are, they said, and you have seen this before, and I think we've talked about it before. We are a Christ-centered Acts 1-8 family. A Christ-centered Acts 1-8 family. That's what they came up with. In other words, our beliefs are centered on Jesus. Our mission can be summarized by Acts 1-8, where, where it talks about you know carrying the gospel from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. And what better word to use to describe our relationships than to say that we're a family, right? And, you know, I was thinking about that as I was studying this uh, passage this week because it seems to me that that actually fits pretty well with what Paul is talking about here in this passage and what we've been looking at this morning. We are a Christ-centered Acts 1-8 uh, family that lines up with what we're calling uh, Paul's mission statement here, right? Um, Christ-centered matches with Paul's ambition to magnify Christ. Um, the Acts 1-8 part lines up with Paul's ambition to see the gospel advance. And the family part, of course, matches with Paul's um, focus on people. And, and actually, I've, I have to say that I've observed that that's, that's part of what has attracted many people to this church family. That we have a theology that's centered on Jesus, hopefully, without getting uh, too tied up in a lot of side issues. That we are focused on a common mission of taking the gospel to the world, whether it's near or far, and that there is a sense of family, of being with brothers and sisters who, who um, will love us and, and support us. Now, that's not to say that we've arrived, of course. Um, I've noticed when it comes to mission statements that, that uh, they often get hung up on a wall someplace and then they get forgotten, don't they? Uh, or they exist more in theory than in reality. And so I encourage you to ask God to make us more and more like this, um, that, our, that our ambition would be for the spread of the gospel, the glory of Christ, and the good of those around us. If that's the kind of church we would be looking for if we were searching for a church, then we should do our part in making it that kind of a church for others as well. And let's start with our own individual lives. Let's evaluate where we stand in each one of these areas, right? Um, 
Not just in what we say. Listen, anybody can just can talk about a mission statement, right? Not just in what we say, but in the practical outworking in our lives. In just a moment, we'll have the opportunity to uh, celebrate communion together. And what's communion about? Um, it's about the good news of the gospel that exalts Christ uh, as our only Savior who by his death on the cross um, brought sinful, rebellious people like you and me into relationship with him. It's about the gospel. It's about Christ. It's about people, right? May that be our focus. Not only in these moments as we share communion together, but always. Let's pray. Lord God, we once again we find ourselves challenged by, by your word, by the things that you've said to us. Lord, it is our desire to be people who are all about seeing the gospel advance, seeing Christ be magnified and seeing people be brought to you and strengthened in their faith. Uh, Lord, we find it easy to say that and to say that's really what we want. Sometimes we find it harder to live that out. And so would you help us by your Holy Spirit, we pray, to, to, um, to live in such a way that this is the description uh, of, of us, not just in theory, but in practice. And Lord, we, as we come to the communion table, we thank you that, that that's really what communion is about, too. It's about the gospel. It's about Christ. It's about people being brought into relationship with Christ. And we thank you that we are among those people who you have redeemed. And so we pray that as we come to this table, Lord, that you would remind us again of the, all that you have done for us, that we might respond in gratitude, in commitment, in obedience. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.